To learn more about earning college credits with study hall courses, go to gostudyhall.com or click the link in the description. Picture this, you wake up and realize you slept through your alarm, and now you have 30 minutes to get yourself and your kids dressed, fed, and out of the door. But one kid can't find their favorite fire truck shirt, the other refuses to brush their hair, and of course, there's no more milk in the fridge for their cereal. Meanwhile, your phone keeps pinging with email notifications and missed calls. You can feel the minutes passing by, and when you finally get everyone ready to go, you step outside to see the bus pulling away from the curb. You're all definitely going to be late. Okay, take a deep breath. Maybe this isn't exactly what your life looks like, but you probably know these feelings. You know the panic of waking up late, the annoyance of not having clean laundry or groceries, the helplessness of not being able to move any faster, Maybe you felt your shoulders tensing up, your breathing getting shaky, or your hands getting clammy. These feelings are all pretty typical. Maybe you even feel this way daily. But the good news is psychologists have some ideas about what you can do about it. I'm Deja Fitzgerald, and this is Study Hall. Enjoy the psychology. In case you haven't caught on yet, we're talking about stress. And people are always talking about how stressed they are because we're stressed all the time. But what is stress really? Stress is the physiological or psychological response to stressors. These stressors can be anything that your mind perceives as a threat or something that requires your attention, either internal or external. A deadline is a stressor. So is running into a grizzly bear on a hiking trail. Or when you're texting your crush and then three dots appear and then the dots disappear and you're waiting but there's like no text. What were they gonna say? Well, yeah, that's a stressor too. The physiological piece of stress usually involves the fight or flight response, which is kick-started by your sympathetic nervous system. Your body quickly floods with energy, your blood sugar spikes, your heart beats faster, you sweat, and you breathe harder. It's pretty clear how the fight or flight response can help with life or death stressors, like when you need to sprint away from a predator. But now we get sweaty while taking exams too. Thanks, evolution. Even though our bodies might react similarly and sweatily to lots of different stressors, stress isn't one size fits all. Psychologically speaking, stress can be a challenge that we think we can overcome. Eustress, or a challenge that we think will overwhelm us. Distress. Distress is a form of stress that can have a negative impact on your abilities or mental state. If you get massive stage fright during your middle school talent show, you might forget all the words and your voice might squeak. And you'll be horribly embarrassed and never want to show your face in school again. As an example I just made up, that definitely didn't happen to me. Eustress can actually be beneficial. If you get nervous before your big performance and still think you're going to nail that high C, then those pre-show jitters could lead to a lot of pride when you do remember all the words and hit every note perfectly. Think of yourself like Goldilocks. With just the right amount of stress, things can turn out okay. And something distressing for you, like the pressure of singing in public or trespassing in a bear's home, might be you stressed to someone else, though it's probably best to leave the bears alone. And while we're not all interested in performing or learning about the inner lives of bears, some big, common stressors hit hard no matter who you are. Objectively negative life events like the death of a loved one, outright hatred or prejudice, or a major injury are pretty universally distressing. But a lot of stressors are smaller. Missing a bus, trying to cook while your kids are yelling, or arguing with your date. These are all examples of daily hassles, little routine stressors that can pile up. For some people, daily hassles might be annoying but manageable, or even a eustress that motivates them to get a bunch of chores done. But if you have an intense job, a complicated home life, or other regular struggles, you might experience more daily hassles in your life, and they might feel more distressing. On top of daily hassles, some people experience identity-based stressors called microaggressions, which are everyday instances of racism or prejudice. For instance, someone who speaks English with a slight accent might be asked where they're from, while nobody else in that group gets asked that question. A woman in her late 20s may be asked about marriage and kids, while a man in his 20s may be asked about his career. A business may have guidelines for acceptable professional hairstyles that disproportionately affect a certain ethnic or cultural group. 
Microaggressions can add a lot of distress to someone's life. But unlike a missed bus or a looming assignment, they're caused by other people reinforcing stereotypes or negative beliefs. So that means we have the power to reduce these kinds of stressors for others by being more thoughtful as we move through the world. And look, I hate to break it to you after all these distressing examples, but even good things can be stressors. It sounds a bit counterintuitive, right? If someone told you that you won two plane tickets to anywhere in the world free of charge, how could that be a stressor? Well, allow me to introduce you to choice-related conflicts. Because first, you need to pick a location, somewhere with world-class concert halls and too many musicians to choose from, or somewhere more low-key, where you can focus on the history and music of a certain region or style. Next, you'd have to decide who's going with you, and you have to pick between your partner or your best friend, who could both really use a vacay right now. Then you have to plan exactly what to do and where to stay and what to eat while you're there, and the choices keep coming. It's stressful. Right? Stressors are part of any experience, whether we're visiting family or celebrating a graduation. But luckily, there are lots of ways we can deal with stress. Let's turn to our psychologist friends, Susan Folkman and Richard Lazarus, who developed the transactional model of stress and coping. This model is built on three steps. First, you have a primary appraisal, where you assess how the stressor will affect your well being. Let's say you lost your job. Well, the work was meaningful to you, so you're kind of sad about it, and it was your main source of income. Next, you have a secondary appraisal. This is when you assess yourself and what resources you have to combat the stressor. Maybe you have plenty of savings, so it's not that bad. You can dust off the old resume, call in some favors, and even take the leap to try something you've always dreamed of doing. That's you stress in action, baby. Or maybe you're living paycheck to paycheck, and your resources are slim. Any way you look at the situation, it's going to be hard to pay the bills, and your distress is sky high. The third step is where you employ coping strategies based on your first two appraisals. Coping strategies are always purposeful, not automatic, and can be anything cognitive and behavioral we do to reduce stress. You might lean on friends, get to job searching, or avoid the problem altogether. After decades of research into coping, psychologists have grouped these strategies into several categories. And the best way to distinguish between them is with an example. Imagine you're in a philosophy class where participation is a big part of your grade. You have some carefully thought out points about Plato's ideal forms, but the professor never calls on you, and the other students seem to ignore you. In fact, you've always sort of felt like the odd one out in this class, which just adds to your stress. You could use a problem-focused coping strategy to tackle the core stressful issue, being ignored. You might keep your hand raised constantly, make really intense eye contact with the professor, or try to speak extra loud and clear when you do get a chance to talk. Or you could try an emotion-focused coping strategy and work on your negative feelings caused by stress. You might take a big deep breath at your desk, remind yourself that this is just one lesson in one class and it won't affect you for your entire life. With a meaning-focused coping strategy, you try to understand the deeper cause of the stress. Why would your classmates or professor dismiss you so easily? What would it take to change their behavior? Is this part of a larger pattern of microaggressions? A social coping strategy would involve seeking out support from others to relax a bit. You might hang out with your friends after class, especially friends who may have experienced similar stressors. Finally, an avoidance coping strategy means you stay away from the stressor in the first place, like skipping class altogether. This is actually a kind of maladaptive coping, so it's not actually going to help you solve your problem. Just like stress isn't one size fits all, each of these coping strategies can have different results. The best way to cope might depend on who you are and the type of stressor you're dealing with. The health psychologist Kelly McGonigal helped popularize the idea that stress isn't always negative, but perceiving stress as negative can be harmful psychologically. For example, in one stress study where participants were given a surprise mental math test, researchers found that participants who were told to think of stress as a good thing were far more confident during the task. So basically, psychologists think that if we use emotion-based coping strategies during stressful tasks and reframe negative thoughts and feelings, we might be able to eliminate many of the harmful aspects of stress. More of that you stress before a big performance and less distress. That being said, when you're faced with microaggressions or a huge pile of daily hassles, emotion-based coping might be the furthest thing from your mind. And that's okay, coping strategies aren't cure-alls. When a stressor is routinely experienced by certain communities of people, social coping might be a crucial tool. 
Sometimes you need to be around people who support you and just get it. Interestingly, the neurotransmitter oxytocin is secreted as part of our physiological stress response and can make us more socially minded. Then it's up to us to choose to talk with other humans and get help becoming less stressed out. On the other hand, avoidance or other maladaptive coping strategies may work in the short term, but it should be no surprise that they can be more harmful than helpful in the long run. And sometimes you learn that the hard way. Avoiding your email inbox or that pile of unwashed dishes won't make them go away. If you don't use healthy coping strategies, your stress can lead to more serious health issues like a weakened immune system, headaches, depression, anxiety, problems with sleep, or even memory issues. So taking a little more time to deal with stress is almost always worth it. Stress happens every day, during your commute, your job, your schooling, your time with friends, and while not everyone experiences the same kind of stress or the same amount of stress, one thing is consistent. We can't avoid stress. And many stressors are too big or too out of our control to manage on our own. But in some cases, we can change the way we think about our stress and the way we cope. We can look for the places where stress can motivate us or prepare us or bring us closer to the people around us. And that may help our stressful lives feel a little more manageable. If you're enjoying Study Hall, Intro to Psychology, and are interested in taking an online course and earning college credit, go to gostudyhall.com or click on this button to learn more. Thanks for watching. See you next time.